Good morning. <clears throat> um, okay, I was going to turn off those fans. <clears throat> Jack, thank you. Okay, <laughs> so uh, welcome to St. Paul's uh, Reformed Church and worship this morning. Um, I'm Brian Hazencope, pastor here, and it's good to be back i was away last week we had thankfully win gross close filling in so we thank win for doing that um, and so just a couple announcements here before we begin uh, the flowers this morning are given to the glory of god and in loving memory of mary kerr from joe and linda kerr and the families so Glad for that. Um, there is a church luncheon next week, um, next Sunday, August 18th. So uh, we're, we're going to have pizza. And so, you know, that's a, a good thing. If you want to bring something, you're welcome to bring something, but there's absolutely no pressure at all. Uh, so that is open. Um, all right, and we have planned here on Monday, that's tomorrow, a consistory meeting. And then Tuesday, Bible study continues. We're going to uh, continue with our uh, topic of wisdom. And we've gone through some of the Old Testament books, and now we're coming to the New Testament, and maybe the pinnacle of what that is, wisdom, biblical understanding of wisdom. And then, um, again, next Sunday, we... We do this again with Bible study at 930, and uh, it is what we call TV Sunday, which simply means that we are broadcast on a local television station, and then the luncheon will follow that. So uh, welcome again to our service this morning, and uh, let's come to now our call to worship. Our call to worship in your bulletin, it says Acts 4, 5 to 12, but I'm going to change that. This is the way we work sometimes. Uh, our call to worship now will be Isaiah 52. Isaiah chapter 52, verses 6 to 7. And that will call us to worship. Worship. 
So let's do that. Uh, let's read from the words of Isaiah. Now, some of you may be familiar with chapter 52. It is a chapter in which begins the uh, fourth servant song and leads into Isaiah 53, which is the suffering servant. But here, um, the Lord says in verses 6 and 7, Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore in that day I am the one who is speaking, here I am. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your watchman. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm starting verse eight. Sorry, I get going in the night. So let's let's stop there with verse seven. This idea of how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. It's an amazing thing. So we're going to talk about that in our uh, passage of Matthew this morning. But first, let's ask for the presence of God. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again, as we come as your people to worship you in spirit and in truth, we ask for your presence to be with us, to lead us, to open our hearts and minds and instruct us in your ways that we might bring glory and honor to your name and that which you have called us to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, our opening hymn is number two, How Great Thou Art. Let's stand and sing.
Okay, we're, we're a small group this morning, but we sound good. I can hear you, that sounded good. So, um, all right. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes to us from Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel 34. And Ezekiel prophesied at a time when uh, Israel or Judah, the southern kingdom, was taken into captivity under Babylon. And so he's talking about, his prophecy is about the idea of how Israel has failed to serve the covenant, failed to be faithful to God. Uh, not only did they commit idolatry, but they had joined themselves to the pagan nations, looked to them for help rather than God. And God calls Ezekiel, and he shows Ezekiel that he is not simply a God who is found in the temple or over Israel, but one who is over the entire world. And just before chapter 34 and the closing chapters of Ezekiel, we see the judgment of God upon Israel and then the judgment of God upon the nations. But there is a remnant. There is a hope as told to us by chapter 11. And when we get to 34 in the following chapters of Ezekiel, it's about the hope to Israel, about the hope to the nations, and about the hope for all creation. And it's found in the Messiah, a Savior, a Son of David, a King. Hear God's Word, chapter 34, reading 1 to 16. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Shepherds are the rulers. Prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, thus says the Lord God, woe shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly, you have not strengthened. And the disease you have not healed. The broken you have not bound up. The scattered you have not brought back. Nor have you sought for the lost. But with force and with severity, you have dominated them. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd, and they became food for every beast of the field and were scattered. My flock wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. My flock was scattered over all the surface of the earth, and there was no one to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my flock has become a prey, my flock has even become food for all the beasts of the field for lack of a shepherd. And my shepherds did not search for my flock, but rather the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds and I will demand my sheep from them and make them cease from feeding sheep. So the shepherds will not feed themselves anymore, but I will deliver my flock from their mouths so that they will not be food for them. For thus says the Lord God, behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep and will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land. And I will feed them <clears throat> on the mountains of Israel by the streams and in all the inhabited places of the land. I will feed them in a good pasture and their grazing ground will be on the mountain heights of Israel. There they will lie down on good grazing ground and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock and I will lead them to rest, declares the Lord 
God. I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken, and strengthen the sick. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with judgment. Here ends the reading of God's word. Well, we come now to a confession of faith. The Apostles' Creed, number 137, in your hymnal. And so let's, uh, let's stand as we recite this together. If you're willing and able to do that, let's do that. And um, we'll confess our faith. So, Christian... What do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We come to our time of prayer, and as, uh, as you know or may know, this is a prayer of confession of sin and the seeking of assurance of pardon, but it's also intercessory, and so we'll pray that way as well. We'll pray for those who are on our hearts and minds today. I did mention in the Sunday morning Bible study, I'll mention here that... Uh, Sam, Sam and Sandra, you, you know, uh, Sam's aunt Helen was in a, a car crash, and so we want to keep her in prayer. She's in the hospital. I don't have any details, but uh, we want to keep them in prayer as well. Um, so let's let's do that. We have uh, oh, also we have Mateus coming home on Tuesday, so we're rejoicing in that. We pray for travel mercies there as well. And there are some things that will go unspoken. So, um, as is our practice, I'll give you a moment to pray silently. I'll then uh, lead us in prayer, and we will close uh, together with the Lord's Prayer. So let's pray. Our Father and our God, as we continue in your grace this morning, we pray that you forgive us of our sin. We acknowledge that you are king, you are sovereign over all. You have, as creator, made us and the world everything that it contains. And we are, as you say, your sheep. And you care for us. And in that care, we find the amazing work of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through him the forgiveness of our sin, which is great and many in your sight. And we pray for forgiveness of that sin. We pray that you bring to us an awareness of our sin, that we may turn from it, that we might grow in grace and love and knowledge of who you are, and that those things that make up eternal life, that we may walk in newness of life, that we might pursue our calling, that we might grow in grace and love for your people and for you. Father, we pray for that kind of forgiveness and we ask again that you strengthen us 
to love as we have been loved, to show mercy as we have been shown mercy, to strengthen as you strengthen us. Father, we thank you and we pray for that preservation <clears throat> to know that we might find refuge in you. You are the Lord and we have no good besides you. Father, we thank you for your people and we pray for your people. It is through your people that we have come to know your salvation. And so we lift up those who are in our hearts and minds today, those who call upon your name, who are struggling with many things, and those who grieve, and those who wrestle with affliction. We think of June, we think of Barb, we pray for Susie and Rosemary and Kathy. We lift up Earl and Shirley and Joe and Linda. We pray for Nancy and Jack. We pray for the Foxhall family. We thank you for the knowledge and plan of Mateus returning on Tuesday. We pray for travel mercy for him. We lift up Sam and Sandra and the family as they commit to you in prayer for Aunt Helen. Pray that you bring healing in that situation. We also lift up Tony, Sandra's son. Father, we thank you for the whole process that Sherry has gone through and is recovering from and finding new abilities or returned, recovered abilities. We thank you for that and the quick healing. We continue to pray for Dot Porter's family as they grieve her loss. Father, we pray again for things that will go unspoken, those things that weigh upon us. We know each one of us has things that we think of, whether it is healing for family members or friends or salvation, that you would save those we care about and who give all appearance that they are lost. We pray for their salvation. We commit them to your merciful hands. We pray for our own struggles. We ask that you give us wisdom that we might perceive your order in greater and greater ways to understand your heart and to reflect it, to be kind, to be merciful, to be respectful and gentle and defend your truth, the gospel of Christ. Father, we pray for our government, those who rule over us, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would turn their hearts, that they would serve your word and truth, that they would uphold your principles in creation, your institutions of marriage and life itself. We pray for that. We pray not only for our congregation and the gifts you have given us, but we pray for others in this community who seek to serve you. We lift them up to you. We pray for their nourishment upon your word and truth, just as we pray for our own. We ask, Lord, that you would fill these congregations with your people, that you would unstop the ears, that you would penetrate the hearts and minds with your love, your word, and your truth. Father, use us. Father, save us. For we pray these things along with the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, that great kingdom prayer saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Him is Psalm 23, and this is about the life of David. It is about a shepherd, it is about sheep, it is about dining at the table. So let's stand and sing number, is it 40? I left my book. <laughs> okay, let's do that. It's time for the young people's message. All right, young people. You're all young people today. All right, there comes a time in uh, family life when you move from being a non-participant, kind of a non-worker, one who's you know, receiving a lot, to one who becomes a participant, one who works alongside. Uh, is given tasks or chores to do, joining in the work of the family. You're instructed on how to wash the dishes, use the lawnmower, wash the car, run the vacuum, all of those things. Um, and you're given what uh, you need to do those tasks, I think. You're, you know, the parents know what you need to do and they instruct you and they give you what you need 
to do it. And even though there are times uh, you may not want to do the work, uh, you know, it, you do realize afterwards, later sometimes, <laughs> that there's a greater sense of what it means to be part of the family, a greater sense of value, worth, purpose, love, involvement in the family, and commitment. So these are things that we experience growing up. Uh, in our passage uh, this morning, Jesus is doing something similar. He is involving his 12 disciples in his work. He gives them instructions on what they are to do and how they are to do it. And so I want you to do this as, as you listen to the text and the message. I want you to tell me afterwards, what are some of these instructions that Jesus is giving? What is their mission? What kind of work will they do? Where are they to go? Where are they not to go? What are they to take or not take? See if you can identify a few of these instructions as we look at the text and as we talk about it. Jesus is involving his disciples, is part of his family. So what would the treat be? Well, I'm hoping the treat, uh, yes, anyway, that was kind of, I forgot to get the treat this morning, but I think someone has been successful in retrieving it. So uh, the treat is this, to be involved in the work is to support one another. We are together in this. It is all for one and one for all. So you know what the treat is, and there you have it. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard when your better half is not with you. <laughs> so we'll, we'll add that as an addendum to the message. Okay, so let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege it is to speak to these young hearts and young minds. And we pray for them as they grow in life and uh, discover uh, the significance of being involved, finding value and purpose in not only family and the things of family, but the wider community and work as well. We pray that they understand these things in deeper ways from your word as you have set before us your Savior, our Lord. We pray that not only for them, but for each one of us, for all of us. And we ask it to the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name, amen. Okay. So let's look at our pas passage now from Matthew chapter 9. We're going to pick up with the closing of 9 and the beginning of chapter 10. So we're picking up with chapter 9 and verse 35, and we'll go through uh, chapter 10, verse 15. So hear God's word. I'm reading from the New American Standard. Some of these words, again, may be different in your translation, but we'll talk about them. And... Uh, if there are questions, please don't hesitate afterwards to ask or save them for next Sunday morning Bible study. It's always a, an enjoyable time, at least for me. So we will start with uh, verse 35 in Matthew chapter 9. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, 
but the workers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out after instructing them, do not go in the way of the Gentiles and do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, Cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you received, freely give. Do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts or a bag for your journey or even two coats or sandals or a staff. For the worker is worthy of his support. In whatever city or village you enter, inquire who is worthy in it and stay at his house until you leave that city. As you enter the house, give it your greeting. If the house is worthy, give it your blessing of peace. But if it is not worthy, take back your blessing of peace. Whoever does not receive you nor heed your words, as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. Truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Here ends the reading of God's word. So as we look at this text, I want you to keep in mind that Matthew is writing upwards of 30 years after the resurrection. By this time, Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, has established churches and written many, if not all, of his letters. So that's important to keep that in. That's a context of, you know, when Matthew is writing. And that's in, a, in addition to the context that we will look at within the, the narrative, uh, Matthew's narrative itself. When we look at this, here's what I want you to take away. Jesus instructs and empowers his apostles to join him in being the hope of Israel and in turn the hope of the world. That second part's a little, we'll, we'll catch up with that next week on those words. But Jesus instructs and he empowers his apostles to join him in being the hope of Israel and then in turn the hope of the world. Our context is Matthew's gospel. Of course, Jesus of Nazareth is the promised Messiah to save his people from their sins, the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures, the Old Testament roles of prophet, prophet, priest, king, and the institutions, law, sacrifice, temple, wisdom, and so forth, reach their climax in this person, Jesus of Nazareth. Matthew communicates these truths through uh, his Fulfillment passages, you remember or recall how he says this was written in order to fulfill or this was written by the prophet Isaiah in order to fulfill. He's got a number of these uh, that he pulls out and shows how Jesus is the fulfillment. So these are those fulfillment passages, but also Matthew has uh, its thought that he structures his gospel with five teaching sections, five teaching sections sections throughout. And we looked at the first of those teaching sections in the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, then what we see or saw 
with chapters 8 and 9 are the supporting aspect of his deeds, his acts of authority, of actually healing and casting out demons and forgiving sin and commanding nature itself. All of it testifying to the inbreaking of God's rule on earth. That's the bigger picture, reversing the curse. Making the unclean clean, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus has taught his disciples who they are at this point. We know from the Sermon on the Mount, salt and light of the world. And then he's taught them who he is as the one who has come to fulfill, not abolish Though he's taught them about love, what it means to love one another and also to love their enemies and how to practice their righteousness, not before men, but before God, not to worry about their needs for God will supply all of these things in that first large section of teaching. But now we come to the second teaching section and just like the previous one. Matthew begins with a summary statement. So now it is uh, time to include his disciples in the work. And so if we look at uh, these verses, we're going to take them a few at a time, maybe one at a time, two at a time. You know, it's kind of uh, different. I don't really have a structure set for this, but it says, And Jesus was going about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, Proclaiming the gospel, the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. That's a summary statement. We saw a similar summary statement in chapter 4, before chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. But here, a summary statement of Jesus' Galilean ministry, much like that one we saw before, is, uh, this is kind of a question, is it, is it a bookend, if you will, or preparation for the next teaching section? It does kind of function that way. It summarizes what has come before and prepares us for what is to come. He is in Galilee of the Gentiles, teaching in their synagogues focused on Israel. The word of God's kingship, his reign goes hand in hand with his acts of healing. And then we come to verses 36 to 38. And he sees the multitude and he feels compassion Uh, because they were distressed or downcast. You may have some different words there, but seeing the multitudes, he felt compassion for them. This is the very heart of God. He is a compassionate God. So distressed and downcast, we said, are these words, but it could also be in your translation, harassed and helpless, weary and scattered, troubled and abandoned. There is no shepherd to lead, guide, or protect. And this is perhaps a a comment, a reflection on Ezekiel 34. It is also perhaps a comment on the failed Jewish leadership. We also see this theme in Numbers 27, but it is something that is common in the Old Testament. And the shepherd, when we note in the Old Testament this idea of a shepherd, it is God who is brought forth. In Ezekiel 34, we saw God will be the one who restores them. God will be their shepherd. But it's also God's Messiah. So his disciples, here we see, um, we've had this general statement of his disciples, Jesus' disciples, No mention of the 12, but here we're going to find a mention of the 12. Um, Okay, so we also see here the word harvest. What does the word harvest mean? The harvest here is not the end of the age in terms of the harvest time and judgment, which it can be. But this is the present activity that is going forth, the reaping of the harvest crop, which is plentiful. This activity requires workers. And so we go from this shepherd to a farmer, these metaphors that are used. And therefore, uh, he says, beseech the Lord of the harvest. And this could be the one who is harvesting as well. 
This is kind of, a, if it is what Carson calls a verbal genitive, you know, the genitive case is often that a case of possession, the Lord of the harvest. But if it's a verb-like genitive, it could be uh, the Lord who is harvesting. So beseech the Lord to send workers into his harvest field. So we did move from shepherd to farmer. And then we come to chapter 10, Matthew 10, 1. And having summoned his 12 uh, disciples, he gave them authority. Jesus here summons his 12 disciples for the purpose of sending them. This mention of the 12 is the first in Matthew. So it's not as though the 12 just appeared. They have been with us, but under disciples. And now he's calling them out as the 12. So we kind of say, you know, is that significant in this idea of the number 12? And we assume the 12 have been with him under that description of disciples, but Jesus gives his authority to them. He's going to share his ministry with them. They will be an extension of his authority. Their purpose aligns with his purpose. And even their message will align with his message and that of John the Baptist to proclaim the kingdom of God. But also, they will have the authority over unclean spirits. This is the first time we see this phrase, unclean spirits, before it's demons. We'll see that again. But to heal as well. So they will give evidence of God's rule coming into the broken, fallen world. And then Matthew lists the twelve. The 12 is perhaps more than reminiscent of the tribes of Israel. Not only does it align with that, but it could be here a reconstituting of Israel itself. Now, not in biological terms, but in terms of being called of Christ. To call out Peter as first is perhaps uh, the idea of first among equals. It's not that Peter is listed first. In the list. So to say first there's Peter is kind of redundant. There must be something more to it. Perhaps it is he is the leader first among equals. And Peter is uh, D.A. Carson again. I just want to reference him. Carson in his commentary takes the lists of the synoptic gospels, puts them together, and you can see how all of them start with Peter and end with Judas Iscariot. And you note some other things in the lists as well that are common. There are three groups of four. Simon Peter leads the first one, Philip the second, and James the son of Alphaeus the third group of four. And this structure could be the idea of sending them out two by two. But nowhere in Matthew's gospel do we see sending out the 70 as we do in Luke, this um, is likely a different situation. But some of the things are parallel as he sends them out. So all of the synoptic lists begin with Peter and with Judas. And there are at least two sets of brothers, right? Peter and Andrew, James and John. And there's the potential here for another set of brothers that we may not pick up on Matthew who is called the tax gatherer. Perhaps that's a sense of humility on Matthew's part to say that he was a tax gatherer. That wouldn't have been something to you know, be proud of, um, but perhaps a sense of humility there. But then Matthew, we know his father was Alphaeus, and so maybe James, the son of Alphaeus, maybe those two are brothers. Nevertheless, this is what we find in this list. These names are there, and some of them are qualified to distinguish them from the others in the list. But these 12, Jesus sent out after instructing them. So the 12, again, the number is significant uh, for a purpose. We know that when Judas goes, as he betrays Christ and and then dies. Um, we know he has to be replaced in the book of Acts. It's one of the first things they do. So they have a set of 12. But sent forth here, this is a form of the Greek word, 
uh, from which we get our word apostle. And so that's its literal meaning is to be sent out. These are the apostles. And so they are the sent ones. Uh, The 12 are instructed not to go or to seek out the Gentiles or the Samaritans. That is, don't take the way to them or to the to the Gentile uh, towns, cities, whatever, or Samaritans. But they are to focus upon God's people, the lost sheep of Israel. They are without shepherd. Again, we think of that passage in Ezekiel 34. So from the early chapters of Matthew, it's very clear that there is a view to the inclusion of the Gentiles. We know that. Even of the Samaritans, we think uh, uh, Jesus does not, though, seek them out at this point. They may come and he may heal and so forth, but he does not seek them out. And he's instructing his disciples not to seek them out, but to go to the lost sheep of Israel. This is very intentional. And we remember the connections to these Gentiles, even the Magi at his birth, Jesus' own words at the healing of the centurion servant. You remember that? Many will come from the east and west and recline with Abraham at the table. He tells them this. The demoniac who he heals in the Decapolis. So, you know, there are Gentiles being healed, but he's not seeking them out. So, why Israel first? Why Israel first? Well, the promises to Abraham were to Abraham and were to Abraham's descendants. So Israel has been given the promise and therefore they must hear first. R.T. France suggests an aspect here of credibility. This is what was foretold. This is what is coming to pass. The good news will intentionally go to the the Gentiles after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Think about it. If Jesus is the Messiah and he is the fulfillment of the promises, why would he go to the Gentiles? What kind of credibility would he have if he simply bypassed Israel and went to the Gentiles first? I mean, think about that. Uh, Even a, a father who gives a promise to his son and he's going to fulfill that promise. Does he fulfill that promise first to the neighbors and then to the son? <laughs> or, you know, it doesn't make sense. This is the order in which things are taking place. And it has always been, it has always been from Abraham on that Abraham will be blessed, Israel will be blessed, and in turn, they will be a blessing. So the blessing comes first to Israel and then in turn to the nations. This is what Jesus says to the Samaritan woman. He says salvation is from the Jews. That's very important. It will be to the Jews and then to the world. That is the order that has been established. And so as you go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, Raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, freely you receive, freely give. So here is that ministry, here is that message, here are the acts that they are to do, even to the point of raising the dead, healing the sick, touching the lepers, healing the lepers. They too will not be made unclean, but make the unclean clean. It's very important. Their message is his message. Their acts and work are his acts and work. They represent him. They come in his name and with his authority. And freely you receive, freely give. It is an authentic, genuine work without cost. Not a money-making scheme. It is authentic and genuine. What they freely receive, they will freely give. And then we have this section here as to what they are to take or not take. Do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts or a bag for your journey or even two tunics or sandals or a staff for the worker is worthy of his support. Now in Mark it says to take a staff, you know, um, but not two. Here it's perhaps, you know, their needs will be met along the way. They are to depend upon the hospitality of those they meet and to trust in the God who will provide. That was part 
of the first large body of teaching. Do not worry about what you will eat, about what you will drink. Remember that. God will provide for them. Um, so here they are to depend upon hospitality. They're not going to need the money. They're not going to need the bag that will carry their food. They are to go and to trust God will provide through the hospitality of those who receive them. And so compared to Mark's gospel, Matthew is perhaps saying that what you have will suffice. There's no need to acquire more. Maybe you see that in the text. Do not acquire these things. So go with what you have. Do not gain more. That perhaps resolves the, is a resolution for the difference between Matthew and Mark. There is a theme though here of worth and worthy, but it is not about moral conduct. This is not about moral conduct, worth and worthy. Worthy of support is likely the provision of hospitality, not payment for services but the provision of hospitality that you know you are worthy of support a worker is worthy of his support we come to the next section here into whatever city or village you enter inquire who is worthy now we have it on the other side require who is worthy and stay uh, with them abide there until you go away uh, worthy are those who are willing to invite them into their homes knowing they come in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. They come with his message. And so the worthiness is accepting them on their terms, on the terms that Christ is coming and his terms, his word. So there is that aspect. That's what is worthy. Remember, Jesus has been traveling the region and the crowds following. There is an awareness of who he is. To accept his messengers is to accept him, and to accept him is to accept God himself. So they say here, he says, give it your greeting or peace. And this is an effective blessing upon the home. Remember, it is effective. They are bringing the gospel of God, which is the power of God unto salvation to these homes. Not worthy, are those who reject them and their message. And this idea of have, you know, let your message return to you is to leave the house taking God's word with them. And that too is effective. Jesus has taught his disciples not to cast pearls before swine. There is no doubt an effectiveness to God's word. Remember, it does not return void. It is effective one way or the other. And whoever does not receive you nor heed your words as you go out of that house or that city, either the home or the city, shake dust off your feet. We know in the Middle Eastern culture that a house or a home providing hospitality to strangers was representative of the community itself. To shake the dust off may have been a reference to treat them as unclean Gentiles. Again, R.T. France notes that carrying the earth of Gentile territory conveyed uncleanness. No one may enter the Temple Mount with dust on their feet. So to shake that dust off is to shake off the uncleanness uh, or the poor rejection they received. To treat them as Gentiles. They're going where? To the lost sheep of Israel. This is significant. Truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Sodom and Gomorrah had become the bar for a, a city of wickedness, a proverb of wickedness. Lot pitched his tent there, you remember, and Abraham if you recall, negotiated with God. What did he negotiate with God about? About the city itself. God said, I'm going to destroy that place. And Abraham said, well, what if there are righteous in it? And they went back and forth, if you recall. Abraham negotiated with God to save the righteous within it. It will be more tolerable, though, for Sodom and Gomorrah. This idea shows the greater significance of the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
the significance of who he is and his word and message that he brings. That is the light that has come into the world to reject the greater salvation, the greater revelation in that sense of salvation of Jesus Christ is to invite greater condemnation even at the city level. So we think about that. We'll talk more about that in the study next week. A few points of application and we close. Matthew's writing upwards of 30 years after the resurrection, as we said. He's recounting for his readers how these things came to be. The provenance of the Messiah, his reconstituting Israel around himself, the hope of Israel, and in turn, the hope of the world. The significance of Israel first and then to the world. Jesus involves or includes his people in the work. This is where we have the provenance of the apostles and what they did. And they did it at a time that is not like any other time. This is a transition period. So when we look back on them, their activities were not normative for the Christian today. But the Christian today and the work today is built upon their foundation. And this is what Matthew is telling his readers then and today. And that this Christ is the shepherd who was to come to restore Israel and in restoring Israel, restoring the world. So Jesus instructs and he empowers his apostles, those who were sent to join him in being the hope to Israel and in turn the hope of the world. That is the hope of my hope and your hope. It is all in Jesus Christ who went to the cross, died and was raised for our justification. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word to us. A word that opens up your wisdom in sending your Son. And how compassionate you are regarding your people. To give your only Son that we may find in him what we need. Healing, the forgiveness of sin, the authority and the power that brings us into relationship to you, that turns our hearts out of death and into life. We thank you for that. We pray for those who are here today. We pray for those who will even watch this message. We ask that you bring them into your kingdom through the power and authority of the shepherd you have set on high in Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, let's, uh, we're going to stand and sing here. Our closing hymn is an insert, Psalm 146a, and this is to the tune of Jesus, What a Friend for Sinners, right? What a friend we have. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus? Oh, yes. I always get those two confused. <laughs> Sorry, David. Okay, let's stand and sing.
Yeah, some of you are confused right now because we, you know, the last part there is it picks up halfway with yea, Jehovah reigns forever, and we do that ending of the chorus. I should have pointed that out. So <laughs> I'm sorry for that, but next time we will do that. And so I'm just glad you were able to sing 146. Um, all right, people of God, receive the blessing that comes from our God. May the God, may God, the God of grace and love and our Lord Jesus Christ and the ever abiding presence of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Keith and Linda and June, thanks for attending.